Hi everybody, it's Terry. I'm back in the shop and I've got a new model to show you. Now this one is just a simple little three channel job. Oh wait, did I say little? I meant big. No, I meant enormous. This is the Great Plains Bird of Time EP. And while it is just a three channel model and it weighs less than five pounds, it has a 118 inch wingspan. That's almost 10 feet. Even if you've never owned a Bird of Time, you probably recognize this model because it has such a unique wing profile. Well, this design dates back to the early 1970s when it was created as a competition sailplane. And over the years, you could build one either from plans or from a kit, or more recently, Great Plains has had an art version that used built-up wings and a fiberglass fuselage. Now, a lot of Bird of Time owners, no matter which version of the kit they had, they were modifying their models by slicing off the nose and adding a brushless motor with a large folding propeller. That way they can go flying without having to set up a winch or a high start. Now this particular model, the Bird of Time EP, is basically a new variant of the ARF that comes from the factory set up for the brushless power system. So there are no modifications to be made. So this huge wing, great for gliding, but a little bit cumbersome in the shop. So I'm gonna take this wing off before I break something. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, I'm back. Not only did I remove the wing, but I also broke it down. It separates into a center panel and then two outer wing panels. And this makes storage and transport much easier. Now, I mentioned that this is an ARF. So basically when you pull these panels out of the box, they look a lot like this. They are already built up and covered in this trim scheme. Now, like most balsa ARFs, you'll probably want to go over the covering with your iron and heat gun to help tidy things up. And this sticker comes separately, so you can put it wherever you want or nowhere at all. The bottom is all white, so after a few flights, I decided to add stripes. This is two inch wide packing tape. There was one stripe here, and then two more on the outer wing panel, and this helps a lot with in-flight orientation. There are no control surfaces on the wings, so they're really simple structures. There's not a lot to do to get them ready for flight. The prime thing you'll have to do is build these dihedral braces, one on each side. And these are really strong components that are made out of two pieces of plywood that are sandwiched by two pieces of aluminum. A couple things to look out for here. In my kit, the plywood that was included for the two braces was of two different thicknesses. So if you're not careful, you can put both thick pieces on one brace, and both thin pieces on the other, and then have a real mess on your hands. So make sure you're paying attention there. The other thing to consider is that the manual tells you to use six minute epoxy to join all this together. Strength wise, it works fine, but I felt like I was rushed to try to get everything aligned before the epoxy set. So I would recommend that you use 30 minute epoxy for this job. Also, make sure that you use plenty of clamps to hold it all together while it cures. Okay, enough about the wing. Let's talk about the fuselage. This is a pre-finished fiberglass piece, and I think it strikes a pretty good balance between being lightweight and durable. All of the internal plywood formers and bulkheads and trays, that stuff's already in there, so you don't have to worry about that. And as with the wing, there aren't many jobs left for you to do, but those jobs are fairly precise. For instance, you have to drill out the firewall to accept your brushless motor. There is a template provided for the recommended Rimfire 32, and that makes things a little easier, but you do wanna make sure you give yourself plenty of time to do it correctly. I think the most important thing to consider with the fuselage is your equipment layout. There just isn't a whole lot of room inside here, especially in the front end, so you want to place your gear to make best use of the available space. You also want to keep in mind the weight distribution. As I was putting this together, I kind of got a feeling that it could end up tail heavy, so I tried to get the battery as far forward as I could. I'll show you what it ended up with. Now let's start at the very front. Here we've got the folding propeller that is included in the kit. And I think it's nice because the spinner and prop adapter are all integrated into one unit. Now, when I have it in the shop, I tend to keep a rubber band on here just so the prop blades don't flop around. Now, next at the firewall, we've got the brushless motor. Again, this is a Rimfire 32, and I have it arranged so that the motor wires exit and run along the bottom. Behind the motor, we've got the battery. This is a Flight Power 4 cell 3600 milliamp hour LiPo and it sits on a plywood tray that's factory installed. There's a little bit of Velcro on the tray and also a strap that wraps around to hold everything in place. Behind the battery, at the rear of the battery tray, is the speed control. This is a Castle Creations Phoenix Edge Lite 75, and I have it arranged so that the motor leads go under the battery tray and forward to the motor wires here. So all of these motor leads are completely out of the way of the battery. 
The power lead for the ESC emerges right here, so you can see that there's plenty of room to fiddle with these connectors and not bash your knuckles against the side of the fuselage. Now, I really appreciate that I was able to get a nice clean installation here, but I think the best part is that no nose weight was required to balance at the recommended location. Now let's look a little bit further back. Under the wing saddle is another plywood tray. Here you'll find the receiver and also the rudder servo. Now, the rudder requires a standard size servo. Specifically, I'm using a Futaba S3010 high torque servo. And it drives the rudder through a long push rod that runs through the fuselage. Now the elevator, that's a slightly different story. This is a full flying elevator, meaning that the whole surface pivots. Now this is driven by a micro servo that is located at the base of the vertical stabilizer. Now this is another one of those areas that's not incredibly difficult to assemble, but you want to make sure you take your time to get everything installed correctly. I think I've covered all the high points of getting this model built, so let's go see how she flies. I've got the Bird of Time EP out of the flying field now. It's a little bit cold today. The thermometer says 21 degrees, so I don't really expect to catch many thermals. But the sun is out and the winds are light, and that's good enough for me. So let's get this thing in the air. You never really know what to expect with the first toss of a hand launch airplane. So I had a buddy throw the Bird of Time EP for the maiden flight, and it turned out to be no big deal. All you really have to do is give it about half power and then a gentle push forward will get it going. And I think you actually would want to avoid using full power on the launch simply because this model has a fair bit of throttle pitch coupling. And that means that the nose pitches up the more throttle that you give it. And that can take you by surprise if you're not ready for it, especially on the launch. Now this behavior is mentioned in the manual, so you can't claim ignorance here. And I'm sure that I could put in a throttle elevator mix in my transmitter to help tune out this behavior. But now that I've experienced it and know what to expect, uh, I think it's no big deal and it's easy to compensate for the sticks. I'm using the recommended setup in this model and it has plenty of power. In fact, it'll haul the Bird of Time EP straight up if you want it to. I suspect that most of us will ease back a little bit on our climbs, but that potential is there if you want it. No matter how quickly you choose to climb, once you get to your soaring altitude, you can kill the motor, let the prop blades fold back, and then put that huge wing to work. Now, I can say without any reservation that the Bird of Time EP has the flattest glide of any model I've ever owned. So far, I've only flown this model in winter conditions with very little thermal activity, but even so, I'm still able to get really long flights, and I can also get numerous climbs for every battery charge. While I have done some loops with this model, I really don't ever see myself doing anything more stressful than that with it. This airplane is really at its best with a gentle touch on the sticks. Because the Bird of Time EP is a three-channel ship, it doesn't have some of the control surfaces that you'll find on other more complex sailplanes, such as spoilers, flaps, or even ailerons. And what that boils down to is that you have fewer tools to help manage your energy. That really comes into play when it's time to land. So make sure that you plan ahead and give yourself a nice long approach. I think the most effective energy management tool that this model does have is the folding propeller. If you open up the throttle just enough to get the motor spinning, the drag of the prop disc will help slow the model down. The only drawback is that it takes very precise inputs. For instance, on my model, if I give it one click of throttle, I get the desired drag effect. However, with two clicks, there's almost no effect that I can see. And if I give it three clicks, the model actually has enough power to start climbing again. I think that covers things for this model. You can find out more details about the Great Plains Bird of Time EP in my written article in Model Aviation Magazine. Thanks for watching.